Hey guys, thanks for checking out the 21 Gun Podcast. I'm your host as always, Kevin Sullivan. I know this is a different time, different day, different set. I'm kind of say his audio is freaking legit. Because I don't have Jeremy to keep you can get a fancy mic fantastic. like that. I'll be running all the cameras. I'll be doing all that stuff. Uh, if that trailer does not sound like something that I, I would say I've had that conversation with 200 people over the last few years. Um, fantastic movie, Quiet Explosions. You can check it out on uh, Amazon. And we'll, we'll talk to, we're going to have some folks on here in a minute. We'll talk to them, uh, find out all the, the places you can watch that. But uh, fantastic trailer. And I just noticed, and I'll have to ask uh, Mark Gordon when he comes on, uh, that one doctor was a Dr. Cher. And I'm wondering if he's related to the director of that movie, which is Jerry Cher. If you guys are interested in finding out more about that movie, check out my interview with her. Uh, I wrote it down somewhere on here. Uh, maybe we'll get to it in a minute. I think it was episode 50 or something like that. But when we find it, we'll, we'll tell you about it. So thanks for joining us. Uh, I, I feel like this is probably one of the more important interviews I've ever conducted over the last five years, and I'll tell you why. I want to ask the listeners to really pay attention and consider what we're talking about here. The Reverend Warriors are dedicated to mental health and mental well-being, and the information shared here literally has the potential to change a life, maybe even save a life. So if you're struggling with the symptoms of PTS, TBI, chronic pain, headaches, fatigue, I mean, the list is a mile long. This doesn't have to be your default. This doesn't have to be, you know, where you reside at this point in time. Today's topic is how to recognize and successfully treat PTS and TBI. And we'll talk about the similarities uh, between the two and this new term of, uh, at least I would call it a new term of, of neuroinflammation. We have, uh, let's see, Dr. Mark Gordon coming on. Dr. Gordon graduated first in his med school class and then became a board-certified family medicine practitioner, a man of my own heart, uh, as I am a, a family medicine PA. Uh, he then went on to expand his practice into sports medicine, clinical orthopedics, cosmetic dermatology, and then interventional endocrinology. Lots of big words for my marine friends, but don't worry, we'll get through this. <laughs> and just for fun, he obtained his pharmacist license I in like the state that. of California. He's a strong advocate for integrative medicine and preventative medicine uh, through the correction of underlying hormonal deficiencies. And of course, we'll explain more what that means. We also are lucky to have Andrew Marr. Andrew is a husband, father, Retired Special Forces Green Beret, co-founder of the Warrior Angels Foundation, TEDx speaker. These guys have a really big resume, if you haven't noticed. Uh, best-selling author of Tales of the Blast Factory, a brain-injured Special Forces Green Beret's journey back from the brink. His book has been turned into that movie that we just saw, uh, Quiet Explosions, uh, directed by Jerry Sher. Oh, here it is. Um, if you want to get into a deep dive on Andrew, you can check out episode 27. And Jerry Sher, the director of that movie, she's going to be on, or she was on, episode 52. So, without further ado, we'll bring on Dr. Gordon and we'll bring on Andrew Marr. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Absolutely, yep. absolutely. Andrew, it's good to see you again. Yeah, good uh, to see you, brother. So I'll, I'll really quickly, just so you, you know the, the audience that you're speaking to, we're the Irreverent Warriors. The Irreverent Warriors are a group of combat veterans, actually, and non-combat veterans, mostly from GWAT, but we get some folks from Vietnam. Uh, we get <laughs> Back in my day. Desert Storm. And the idea is, at least our, our mission Coast Guard is, veterans. Say, our theory is that one of the big issues with mental health is isolation and people kind of suffering by themselves and not wanting to get out there and seeing uh, or, or even just being in public. And what we do is we pull them out of isolation and we get into these um, silkies hikes. So uh, uh, Andrew might recognize it as uh, ranger panties. Uh, the Marines call them silkies. Uh, we put on those and we carry 22 uh, kilograms of gear and we go for 22 kilometers and we rock and we sweat and we suffer together but we laugh uh, we bring the com camaraderie back into the equation and uh we're having a lot of good every hike i would say every hike we do we start off with like last year I think we had 35 this year we have 70. every hike we do we reach at least one person i know we're saving a life for each one so it's, it's awesome i want to start off with this a nice softball because um you guys both have multiple appearances on the Joe Rogan Experience, and you reach m millions of potential patients. That's how you reached me as a patient, actually. What is it like knowing that every time you speak publicly, especially in a, in a big platform like Joe's, that there's a very good chance that you're going to be saving a life? I mean, I would say it's guaranteed you're going to be saving a life when you when you go on his show. I'll let either of you answer. Go ahead, Aaron. I mean, Andrew. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, that's no softball question, man. <laughs> uh, I, I, I here's my answer. I do the best prior to to take a pause, 
to think about where I've been and to think how grateful I am to experience right now and to think how difficult that process was and, and then to give thanks for that. And then I think about how that is multiplied and magnified to the nth degree to our population. And I just simply ask that, uh, that the light can shine through and I can, you know, uh, the truth can come out of my mouth and hopefully fall somewhere that somebody needs to hear it and they, and they can receive it, man. So, you know, that's probably how I go about it. Just being just grateful for the experience, grateful to deliver what we know is, you know, earth shattering information. And, um, and that's why me and Mark, basically anybody who wants to talk, will come on the platform and do it because we know it makes a difference. So it, it, it you know, I don't think we sit around and think about it, but at times, you know, usually like right before this, like I sit with it and like it, it, it's, um, it's rewarding, it's significant, it, uh, it makes my life worth living. Um, so it's, it's very impactful. Sure. I, I, I get very stressed out when we go into a heavy topic because I want to articulate it to the best of my ability. I don't want to get ahead of myself or behind myself. And then afterwards I'm like, shit, I totally forgot this part. I totally forgot that part. So yeah, I feel you as far as, you know, something this important has to be articulated and uh, you need to speak to the audience and hopefully reach somebody. And that's, that's, that can be stressful. How about you, Doc? Oddly enough, it was from a Joe Rogan podcast in which I started doing the deep diving in terms of traumatic brain injury and where it all kind of stems from and specifically the hormonal aspect of things and Dr. Mark Gordon's simplicity of get the blood work, check the hormones, place the hormones, go forward because if you have a patient that is healthy and they're not on the floor riling in pain and riling in jacked up hormones, then you can treat the rest of the shit that's wrong. It's just the best way to do it. Well, to, to expand upon it, every time we go on to someone's platform, podcast, show, we know that we're going to touch a multitude of people that will have the ability to say, wait a second, you mean there's something more than just taking a handful of colored pills? There's something else we can do? And here's, you know, here's a special yep. ops guy who has suffered through a lot. He talks about it to some degree on every one of the programs. And you start relating to, I mean, the people who are listening start relating to what he's saying. And how many times you or a number of the other 400 plus uh, military individuals, both active and veterans, have said, the reason why I'm calling you or the reason why I'm asking you into the program is because what Andrew said is exactly what I'm experiencing. I haven't told anyone. No one's ever asked me. You're telling me and I'm sharing with you. And that saves a life because a lot of times the guys who do go on to attempt suicide or commit suicide it's because they didn't have any place to go. Yeah. They were turned inside. And they isolate it as opposed to knowing that there is an organization like Warrior Angel Foundation that's out there, you know, putting their lives, our lives, everyone's life on the line to do something good. And the movie, you know, epitomizes everything that we've been able to do in the time that we work together. You're 100% you're correct on that. I remember, must have been five or six years ago, Andrew. I, I don't know. Whenever your first appearance was on, on Joe Rogan, I, I used to just listen to him working out or going to work or whatever. And I'm driving down the road and I hear your story and I'm like, holy shit, this guy is, is speaking my language. And here I am looking, like you were saying, I'm looking at 10 different medications that I'm on, uh, feeling horrible, not feeling good and being like this, this guy. And so after that, I was like, I got to find out something. I got to find out more. And, uh, and then I headed down the, the rabbit hole, which, by the way, changed how I became or how I was practicing medicine at the time. You know, I learned that. You know the, the the standard protocol of treating the symptoms versus treating the underlying cause can be more of a problem than <laughs> than it actually fixes. Well, them. hey, Sully, I can remember you texting me uh, several years back, and you were like, "Hey, man, like, 
this guy's going to put me on vitamins? <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> I, I have that. I have that in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great exchange. But but you were, uh, you know, I challenged you to, to keep an open mind and and um, you know look at X, Y, and Z. And yeah. you know, to your credit, you did. And uh, those those outcomes are, you know, now established. But you know, it, yeah. well, it's a joke. Um, what's really specific is the fact that when we have B vitamins, vitamin D. Um, various mineral support and whatnot, you actually can heal the brain, but you actually have to implement those along with the hormone requirement as well. Yeah, it, it's it's insane. Um, sometimes when you think about, hey, I just all this world of problems, it's like we can't see the forest for the trees because it's right in front of us. The right. solutions alternatives right in front of us and oftentimes as mark has proven we can go a natural route to do it and that is the preferred way the body is meant to work sure Correct. yeah no, another thing is you know everybody calls them vitamin supplements they're nutraceuticals which means they're natural forms of medications if you look at what we use in our treatment protocol 80 to 90 percent of it is are these nutraceuticals you'll see that 99% of them are by prescription only outside the United States, only dispensable through physicians and or pharmacies. Right. So when you look at the, uh, the relevancy around the planet, these are real medications. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, what, <laughs> uh, Andrew is being kind there, but it was more like a, uh, we'll say a special forces NCO speaking to a junior grade officer. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of like, get your head out of your ass, dude. <laughs> You yeah. asked for help. Believe in this system. Just give it yeah. a try. And I think you told me, you're like, give it six months and see what happens. And then within the amazing thing was with a daily headaches for me was just that was standard. Right? right. So I didn't even I was just like, that's who I am. And I, I specifically magnesium deficiency, which is pretty common. And when it comes to TBI, you may just need to alleviate that and your cortisol and testosterone then you're good to go constantly you know i had one of those massagers in the back of my head living on ibuprofen and then what i noticed the fr that's probably the first thing that just stood out for me is that i thought I, i've had a headache in like two months and then another month went by and then after gosh i've almost been on this program for a year i can say i've had three headaches over the last 12 months that's unbelievable to me yeah. i mean that was a daily occurrence mm-hmm um, I, again, man, that, that's life changing. And, I, and I, I can remember being in that situation when you're living like uh, living with that or living with daily migraines and just thinking, man, if I can turn this down from a 10 to a five, yeah. I would just be thankful for the rest of my life. You know, yeah. it's huge. Yeah, yeah. You can't quantify that. It's amazing. Right. And those migraines are indicative of this neuroinflammation that I know we're going to be talking about, sure. which is really the foundation for insomnia migraines, pain syndromes where narcotics don't work. And it's addressing the, the nutraceuticals basically address this inflammatory, you know, condition that is an effect of whatever the primary insult was, whatever the primary uh, head trauma was, it secondary phases all this inflammation, sure. depression, anxiety, bipolar, obsessive compulsion, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, MS, they're all inflammatory conditions. And the newest one that we're working on is ringing in the ears or tinnitus or tinnitus, mm -hmm. where I had a doc, non-military uh, doc uh, here in California, call me and ask me about, is there anything we can do for this horrible ringing in his ears? And I said, yeah, go on product so-and-so twice a day. And he called me in two weeks. He said, it's gone during the day. He's got a little bit during the night. So we're waiting to see after a month. So our new focus is this ringing in the ears, which is an inflammatory symptom, inflammation oh, really? of the auditory nerve of the nerves or the little bones in the muscles sense, yeah. in the uh, middle ear. And, uh, Banging around your head. So we're, you know, we're expanding. We've reversed 18 diabetics. It wasn't the goal. Reversed yeah. 18 diabetics. We have uh, uh, someone who was med boarded from the uh, seals who had uh, was medically discharged because he had the audacity to develop um, multiple sclerosis. In 30 days, he was 40% better. In 60 days, he was 50% better. 
Gosh. So it's all inflammatory illnesses. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how you say that because when I was going through my workup, that was one of the... Something specific that you can do to combat this is when we're talking about neural inflammation, obviously you have to reduce the amount of insulin and carbohydrate and sugar in the diet. Now, there comes problems when we're talking about cortisol dysfunction and other types of things where you absolutely have to have carbohydrate, but there's an opportunity with this in which you reduce the amount of carbohydrate and sugar and then you could reduce the amount of inflammation and increase the amount of good cholesterol while lowering your lower bad cholesterol things they were telling me they're like oh this is ms this looks like classic ms and and they couldn't diagnose it and everything and, it, and it's that kind of piggybacks on my next question we know it as tbi ptsd <laughs> cte but that terminology is evolving, right? Uh, the more we learn about this, what is the proper name for this condition? You've already said it, but I'll just bring it up anyway. Neuroinflammation. Right. That's it. The, the problem I have is we tend in medicine, I'm talking about all forms of medicine, we tend to like to use labels as a means of expressing something that we don't fully understand at the foundational level, at the causative level. Mm -hmm. And as we start learning about the causation as opposed to just how to best best mask the presentation, uh, then we'll find that the terminology or the labeling disappears and we're left with a physiological process. Neuroinflammation is a physiological biochemical process. What is depression? The psychiatrist can't even say explain yeah. what it is. They can tell you symptoms that are associated with it. But, you know, I told you, I, I have a very tough time believing in the packaging of what they call PTSD, because if you look at the overlapping between the symptomatology of PTSD and TBI, there are more of the issues that fall into TBI, and I believe that the uh, occurrence of PTSD is the continuum from a missed traumatic brain injury. Sure, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's, that's funny how you say that. My next question is... And NFL and VA are going to have to pay out billions of dollars, which, as we just found out, when the last administration printed, what, $12 trillion, that um, modern monetary theory exists for an empire, you can expand at will, so this BS that there's no money is totally garbage, and it just means they actually have to pay people um, and actually put out the money um, for people to get treatment, specifically like myself, who don't have access to the VA, since I'm not a veteran, technically, and uh, provide that funding for people to actually get the support that they need, and they don't have that. So it uh, basically shows you where the interests lie. You've had said uh, in the past, every diagnosis of PTSD is a missed opportunity to treat TBI and neuroinflammation. When I first heard that as a, pro as a provider and someone who was diagnosed with PTSD, I was like, what's this guy talking about? They're two different things. Did you get hit in the head or did you see something traumatic that you can't escape? Uh, but they're one and the same. Yeah, it's like you have a pinhole in your tire. Someone says you got a leak in your tire. Well, it's a leak in the tire until what? Until it's flat. Mm -hmm. So the leak is the TBI that progresses on to the flat tire because you missed the opportunity to fix the tire when it was still full of air. Sure. Trauma is trauma. So is getting blown up and shot better or worse than the person who is held at knife point or gun point and then has trauma? Or is it different than the person who gets in a car accident or the person who's a construction worker and falls from a tree right does it matter no what matters is the end result you know so a lot of analogies but uh yeah. the, the, the continuum is there sure are, are they ever mutually exclusive do you ever uh, look at someone and say yeah this is ptsd this yeah. is tbi what we're refuting it right now um, the psychiatry, the world of psychiatry, you know, says, okay, you have a person who has never had any physical contact, who's never shot a uh, Gustav, 
you know, rocket off or a javelin, has had no blast trauma, no slip and falls. They had a perfect delivery. They never roller sk skated and fell. They never learned how to bicycle ride and fell. They never learned how to walk and fell. And they were perfect, but they're under <laughs> chronic stress in an environment and they develop all the symptomatology that we're gonna label as PTSD. How can you prove that is anything but PTSD? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out 20 years ago, a chemical was found. And eight years ago, it became into our area of neuroinflammation. I'll just throw it out there, it's called fractalkin. Well, under stress, this chemical allows the brain to develop inflammation just like you develop after any one of those traumas that you have. So the statement all, or the adage, all roads lead to Rome, there are many ways to turn on the system that gives the same neuroinflammation that will be perceived as being PTSD or TBI or MTBI. Sure. So there's a chemical a, responsible. We're starting to see a spike in that uh, with post COVID. You know, people have had COVID, yes. we're starting to see depression, insomnia, you know, right. whatever. I wrote, it, I wrote about it in April in anticipation that we're going to see a spike, as you just said, in the occurrence of neuro behavioral and neuropsychiatric issues because of the cytokine storm. Uh, cytokines are exactly the chemicals that fractalkin allows to be made in the brain that leads to the change in the biochemistry of the brain such that the pathways, the biochemical control systems, the fly-by wire to the different parts of the brain that control your depression, anxiety, bipolar, anger, uh, moodiness, you know, um, buying sprees, whatever, they're lost, the control me mechanisms. And we see it quite frequently in cytokines. With, um, part with the Alzheimer's disease. They lose oh, yeah. the frontal lobes, which is the executive functions, which allows them to, you know, control how they respond to things or sequential um, activities. So, um, you know, there are other illnesses that show us when we lose certain chemistry in the brain, and that's what happens in blast trauma. It's an inflammation that disrupts the normal flow of chemistry. Sure. Yeah, and I want to jump in there, especially for our guys and gals listening in. You know, so what it what this translates to or what it equates is there's a number of mechanisms of injury that lead to potentially neuroinflammation or chronically, you know, a chronic state of neuroinflammation. But it doesn't just have to be a quote unquote injury. It could be a surgery, it could be environmental toxins, it could be a the wrong diet, it could be medications. It's like Mark said, living in a highly stressed um, state and environment all produce or have the ability to produce that same uh, consequence that is inf inflammation, neuroinflammation, which then leads to chronic neuroinflammation. So that's the point here is there's there is a number of ways that can lead to that. And we want to call, you know, we as uh, as people, we want to hold on to uh, this is my depression. This is my anxiety. This is my post traumatic stress disorder. And this is really uh, allowing somebody to really step above that and saying, no, no, that doesn't belong to me. It's not mine. It's something that I ex am experiencing and I'm experiencing it because it is an effect of a cause. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we need to identify what is that cause and eliminate that and then treat the brain and the body in the way that Mark uh, is is way more qualified to talk on than I am, but but that would bring it home, uh, you know, for you guys out there listening. Like, hey, man, all these different things out there that we do can lead to this, and then yep. you don't have to be knocked out in a huge explosion in a coma for that process to happen. It can happen just as a natural byproduct Soldiers. of you know being in the military and uh jumping repetitively just doing uh, repeatedly firearms training all these types of things uh chronic exposure to low level blasts well there that is a uh cumulative effect that is very consequential in the long run and so these are all the ways that can contribute to us losing resiliency that contributes to that neuroinflammation. Mark, correct me where I messed no, it up. <laughs> hey, you've listened to my rhetoric for over five years and you've got it down, okay? And you translate it <laughs> very well. So I'm gonna stop speaking Russian and you can keep the English going. Well, it, but, it, it's very important to break out of that, um, um, I don't even wanna call it that paradigm that we've been taught is, is the way things are for the last 20 years. I mean, one of the biggest takeaways from your film, Quiet Explosions is, 
the I don't remember her name, Annie, Anne, the, Annie, the yeah. uh, naval cadet who was sexually assaulted, who who developed all the the symptoms of neural inflammation. The the nine eleven firefighter. When I was watching his story, I was waiting for the and then a beam hit me on the head or something like that. But I I don't think he was in the towers, right? He was just affected because he lost his Correct. his crew. Yeah. No, no, I mean, I, I, he wasn't actually in the towers, but he was at ground zero on, on that day. But yeah, and, and those guys were exposed to a tremendous amount of environmental toxins that yeah. wasn't even accounted for early on. And the government said that it wasn't even a, a, an issue until years later. I don't even know if they're still uh, owning up to it, but, but just setting straight uh, record straight there for Sully. But yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Sully, you, you bring up a good point because you know what, man, people uh, came to us and they said, hey, you need to remove Annie's uh, story uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the decision was made to leave it in there because uh, it wasn't right to take it out. But now so many people have reached out and they said, hey, I had no idea that something like that could lead to the same symptoms as this. Yeah. And so many people who have now been in the same situation have reached out and said, hey, I now know that what what's been the cause of all this you know because, because of, of Annie's story so that's how why important that was you didn't have to have this physical beating over the head to produce these symptoms as as shown clearly in the film so that, that's one of the things that i think is really just uh, uh earth shattering you know groundbreaking as far as the film coming out and bringing out these things because jerry did such a masterful way where you can just sit there and watch and, and grasp these very advanced neurological concepts and just the most routine way that's very entertaining and that's why the movie's taken off and doing so well yeah and he uh, epitomizes that chemical fractalkin that chemical that created her inflammation as though she had physically been a i mean he, she was physically abused but to be you know hammered with the uh, blast waves or with uh, physical uh, contact to the head and that's what the chemical does and does, until does, they recognize it, they'll continue perceiving that it's, uh, you know, she just wanted to be depressed. Does the blood work that you take uh, now, if, if anyone ends up having watched the movie directly, um, uh, it took me a couple of times to get through it, to be honest. Uh, it was pretty rough. That's people going through the same things that I'm going through. And uh, what was interesting, too, is you had different walks of life so nfl players navy people uh, just different types of people and uh we're all going through the same things and the medical system refuses to acknowledge that one hormones even exist and then two that they're required for daily life and then on top of that that you can actually utilize these medications to then live out a better life it's crazy. Uh, being treated by Dr. Gordon, they take a few pints of blood. He's not like 10 come minutes on. They're I just pulling it. <laughs> pulling it. Uh, but is there, I, I guess in my head, how I look at it is you're looking for a fingerprint. You're looking for, um, like, if someone says, and this is what I was feeling, right? Because remember, I was hammered with, you have PTSD. You have PTSD. And I got to the point where, okay, I have PTSD, and then, of course, all the side effects of that, right? Oh, I'm less than a person. I'm not a warrior. Uh, right. I can't fly airplanes. I feel like shit. I hate myself. And you go through that whole thing, right, just because that's what they're telling you that you have. Uh, I was worried that I would go through yours because I, I finally had something I could hang my hat on. I was like, wait a minute. Um, and, and if, you know, I've read through my medical uh, um, charts, and it's like, yeah, uh, Flyer had sustained uh, su or unconsciousness during sustained combat flight was, uh, you know, uh, retrograde, anterograde amnesia. All that stuff's in there, but it was still, no, 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 this is just PTSD. And I don't want to say just, but it's PTSD. So I was worried that being a patient of yours, you were going to look at my blood work and be like, yeah, there's nothing here. It's all mental for you. And, and I was, I, I mean, I can tell you, I was like, God, and, and this sounds awful. I don't want to, uh, but I guess you, you have to think of the state of the mind. I was thinking, I hope he finds something because to me, at least, like I said, I could hang my head on it yep. and maybe get treated and maybe feel better. Cause Controversial statement. Psychiatry is a creation post-World War II as a counterintelligence vacuum, essentially. 
how do you scoop up a ton of information about your enemies? And how do you then take that information and then apply it against them and against the entire population? Well, that's what they did during World War II. And so you had this creation uh, during World War II and post-World War II, you had this creation of psychiatry, which in my opinion is a pseudoscience. Um, there's always a physical, and just like Dr. Mar Gordon's saying, there's cytokines, there's the F word, I can't remember, um, and uh, different symptoms that you're going to be able to follow, and you can utilize different things to be able to solve those issues. And the fact that the medical institutions are focusing entirely on psychiatry and saying, oh, you have PTSD, oh, you'll never be good enough, oh, here's a bucket of pills to take. Oh, well, none of it works, so take double the medication. <laughs> well, that's totally BS. And obviously, it's not true on its face. Um, obviously, you should seek counseling if that's from a pastor or from a chaplain or, or from someone who's a good listener. Um, but my opinion, stay away from psychiatrists and psychologists. Um, if they're not using hormone replacement and solving the underlying issue, then they're not qualified to be treating this illness. Because I felt like shit for what they what, were doing with me. What's the objective parameters that a psychiatrist uses? Counterintelligence. That's the point. <laughs> That's the point. And we introduced 30 points of objectivity along with a great series of almost 3,000 people uh, to see patterns. One of the gifts I have is pattern recognition. And the first pattern I recognize is when you're low normal, still in the normal range of a lot of these hormones that the... I swear to God, I'm going to beat the next doctor, whoever says low normal. There is no such thing as low normal. There is no such thing as high testosterone or high um, levels in your blood. Okay. The, the lab values are a population level of sick people who you're then taking blood. And then it is an average of sick people and the amount of hormones that are in their blood. Okay. It is not 16 year olds who are still sick in a sick society. Um, but they're not 16 year olds, um, living in an isolated Island, uh, that are Welsh or Norwegian or Samoan warriors. And, um, boating every day and fishing and hunting boar and like dinosaurs and shit and uh take the eating the blood of their enemies uh, okay so it's not like you can't take these people at face value it's not what it means and then the question i would always ask is so which lab values the ones from 2014 or the ones that are currently used well if a doctor says they don't know then they're they either are completely ignorant or they're lying to you because the 2014 numbers were 200 nanograms per deciliter above what they are now. So are you telling me that I should be more healthy now? Or are you telling me should I have levels that are lower? Well, if you're telling me I should have levels that are lower, you're telling me that I should be sick. So that's just ridiculous on its face. VA docs and traditional docs say, well, you're just within the goalposts. I mean, the kicker, you know, on the Super Bowl, the kicker doesn't want to kick and hit the post. He wants it right in the middle. It shows his skill and the quality of what he has. Right. And our bodies have that same thing. You can be, you know, a hypothetical range of 10 to 90. You can be at 11 with all the symptoms. And the doctor says, oh, you're within the normal range. But that's only by one point. We want it to be dab in the middle to give you the optimal benefits still within the physiological ranges. And that's where we've been so successful is not using this just within the range. It has to be at least in the middle and sometimes higher to get the benefit. Uh, I agree with Dr. Mark, but he's trying to say it in a way for people to understand, but then also stab doctors at the same time, which then doesn't help patients. So, okay, let's talk about this in specific language. Testosterone exogenously administered through an injection into your leg or your chest or your shoulder or trap. You inject it. The goal is to utilize 150, 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams, somewhere in there, 
to then get you to 50 free testosterone. This is for men, by the way. So 50 free, roughly around there, testosterone. Well, what is that going to produce? It's going to produce your total testosterone at 1,800, something like that. Okay, well, the variation between 800 and 1,500 is a tremendous number. Okay, it looks big on a, on a chart. Well, it means nothing. What it means is that you need to get your level up to the 50s around there somewhere and actually have symptom resolution. Well, symptom resolution comes from getting your level to the area in which you can, one, tolerate the medication, you actually use the medication, and then you don't have any uh, crazy side effects. Well, crazy side effects of testosterone are um, on the extreme end is activation of gynecomastia that is genetic okay so testosterone that you take does not always give you gyno gyno is genetic you're born with it you have a tissue that's inside the breast tissue and um, that is activated and then you need surgery to get that removed you don't need medications cancer medications specifically like arimidex which is going to deplete all of your um estradiol which is what we utilize that's one of the reasons why we use it for tbi is the fact that we're upregulating estradiol so then you actually have the ability to decrease neuroinflammation which is the whole point of what we're doing and this is why i appreciate dr mark gordon but he's trying to skirt around it while actually giving people an answer, but it's just not clear enough, which it should be clear enough because it's that easy. It's just 100, 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams, somewhere in there, injected twice weekly or more, and then get to 50 nanograms per deciliter free test, somewhere around there. Symptom resolution, you don't feel like shit, you can tolerate it, you don't have crazy symptoms, and you go on with your life. And the parameters that we look at are um, biomarkers, which are the neurosteroids. Neurosteroids are the unique hormones that are produced in the brain that regulate functionality. And if they're deficient, meaning that they're not in the optimal range, but in the lower of normal, you get symptoms. We know that because when we bring it back up to this normal range, optimal range, you get better. Huh, Sully? You get better. <laughs> you really do. Uh, sleep. I used to, my bed, I mean, it might as well have been a bed of nails. I would look at it and be like, God damn it, I got to go to bed, right? I would stay mm -hmm. up as late as I could mm -hmm. to avoid that. Now I'm going to bed at like 8, 8 p.m. because it's, it's, it's restful. It's something I look forward to. I didn't think that was even possible. I didn't mm -hmm. even think that was possible. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you had mentioned something and I think it just lost, I just lost it in my train of thought here, but, um, we'll, we'll move on. I have a, another, uh, question here. Knowledge of TBI, PTSD, whatever we'll call it. All right. <laughs> for the, for the episode, we'll call it neuroinflammation. Um, it's been gaining traction over the last 10 years or so, maybe even 15 years or so. Uh, we've talked about it, or I rarely talked about it as a kid. I mean, you know, wrestling, you got, you got hit in the head or whatever it was, get up, you know, rub some dirt in it and, and move on. Uh, and then we had things like drink some water, change your socks. Will Smith had a movie about this topic. I, I don't even remember the name. Concussion. Might have, concussion yeah. Put on your immunity glow belt. Yeah, so he had one. Uh, there was a ton of high profile deaths like Robin Williams, where they during his autopsy, they saw I think it was Lewy body dementia, mm -hmm. uh, which is an inflammatory condition. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have the WWE suicides. You have the NFL suicides. Junior Seau. I mean, I'm a I'm a Patriots fan. Mm -hmm. I was shocked when that guy uh, killed himself. I mean, he seemed to be at the top of, of the world, right? Um, the list goes on. I can only assume as a practitioner that, uh, again, we'll just say TBI, becoming part of the daily lex lexicon helps you, right? Helps you to bring this up in conversation when someone comes in and says, I suffer from migraines. Okay. W what do you mean by that? Okay. You suffer from migraines, but what's the root cause of that? Does it help? Uh, yeah. Well, you know... We have, as you remember, a quite extensive uh, intake form that goes through uh, hundreds of questions relative to uh, symptoms that you might have, because what we're finding is things like uh, migraines and insomnia and twitches and um, sensitivity to light and sound. 
they all have a uh, an inflammation, inflammatory component to it, which causes sensitivity. It's like if you've ever been drunk and you wake up the next morning and you're light sensitive, sound sensitive, you're just irritable, you're yelling at people because you don't feel well. That's the brain on, on fire. And that's the neuroinflammation. So we ask people who come in with migraine as their presenting complaint, we ask an extensive history of from birth on, because a lot of times they miss it because they think it's irrelevant. They think that it's not significant enough. It's like the big battle that uh, Andrew and I had when we were guests of the Ministry of Defense in London is that they thought that the only way that you can develop traumatic brain injury or PTSD is if you were knocked unconscious. And that's not the truth. And even in neuroradiology, the x-rays, the radiological studies that are done in people who are knocked unconscious, in 85% of the people who are knocked unconscious, the classical radiological technology of CT and MRI are negative. There's nothing seen, but they go on to develop all the symptomatology, migraines, uh, insomnia, mood disorders, you know, panic and what have you. And it's all because this inflammation that, as Andrew already stated, can be. Uh... And this is why when we're talking about TBI, you have to back things up with the blood work, but also with the right type of imagery. So my understanding, it's diffuser tensor tensive imaging DTI and I'm going to get this wrong, but it's magneto. So it's like MEG or MAG is the acronym. And it's a different type of imagery that you have to do, which then looks at the individual parts of the brain and then, you know, where things are working. And this is why you have to work with a learned doctor who's not a flap doodle and who actually knows what they're talking about. <laughs> An accumulative effect. It's like the analogy I use is either you can have 10 dimes or $1. They both are a hundred, but one happens after small little bites and the other one happens with one major incident or event. So it, it's, it all leads up to it as well as there are two major articles that came out showing that people who had an injury 17 years ago can start having symptoms now that they find the markers, the inflammatory markers present right now. <clears throat> wow. So it can take 17 years if it's yeah. a mild process with a lot of mild events occurring throughout the course of life. I mean, you think about all the, the elderly patients who lived full lives and then suddenly, and it's almost overnight happened, both my grandparents, it, they're gone, right? They, over several months, they they uh, go into a state of dementia and they're unrecognizable. And it's, it's mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it can take a while. Um, it, you just... It, it, Something there just uh, rekindled what I was thinking. So how come evolution hasn't taken care of this? Or did we find a way to, to kind of shortcut evolution and, and keep messing things up? Andrew stated it. Biological resiliency. What biological resiliency is, you guys go out in the field of battle and you put some Kevlar on your vest, and that gives you protection. Well, you can either put one plate, two plates, three plates, how many plates you want to protect your body. Well, we do that, we build it by good nutrition, good hydration, meditation, by dropping the chemistry that causes the problems and embellishing the chemistry that improves us, like fish oil, omega-3s, like vitamin E, like N-acetylcysteine, good amino acids, minimizing alcohol, which strips the Kevlar away by diminishing the brain's production of growth hormone which has an incredible protection against not only inflammation in the brain, but also to reverse or treat people with treatment-resistant depression, people who are on a multitude of medications and... LOL. <laughs> um, treatment-resistant um, depression just means traumatic brain injury. And uh, I would challenge anybody who actually has that specific diagnosis to take that to the medical board and then follow down all the traumatic brain injury symptoms and look at the uh, the bulging eye eyes of the uh, the medical boards and the uh, the doctors because they won't have any words to say because they don't want to get sued. Their depression continues. 
turns out there are five hormones that regulate that. And the one that a 2017 article came out of all places from England, and they had tough time understanding how growth hormone is important to anyone with traumatic brain injury. But this article clearly stated in 61% of the people who had treatment resistant depression, they had a growth hormone deficiency and within one to two months <laughs> treatment with growth hormone disappeared and they ended up sleeping better, uh, brighter minds, uh, less irritability and therefore less flying off the handle and better communicative skills. And these are the benefits of when you drop inflammation in the brain. And that's one of the things that growth hormone does. Right. So it's, it's important. And, and I'll ask Andrew about this. It's important too that, uh, especially if you have a family and, and even friends, if you're close with friends and stuff, uh, the best advocate for you is usually the people you're living with. Uh, my wife tells people, holy cow, you should see the change in Kevin. I, I, I mean, I do feel the change, but not as dramatic as she apparently sees in me. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Andrew, you were the, the tip of the spear, right? You were what a lot of guys in the Army want to attain to. I mean, they make movies out of the Green Berets. What was your first, uh, I guess, I don't want to say symptom, uh, your first indication that something was amiss, something wasn't firing right. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was it was pretty easy, a uh, complete loss of libido. And so I got back from my last deployment, um, 2013, and uh, I'm very attracted to my wife, you know, still. And <laughs> you have seven kids. <laughs> yeah, 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 we're maybe too attractive, you know. <laughs> and it just, it just wasn't there, and that just struck me as, as very odd because it was um, something that, that was new, it wasn't, uh, you know, a pattern in my timeline. Uh, so I just thought, hey, man, we we were pushing really hard on that last trip. It's going to take some time for, I guess, my body to come back online. But as I look back, you know, it never came back online, and that was kind of the first. Uh, pattern disruptor that I saw, oh man, this is, this is weird. And then it went into, you know, sleep, uh, being thrown off and being tired and then opening up Pandora's box. But those were like the first three that came on very mildly and then expanded outward. Were you afraid to bring that stuff up to your, I don't we had flight docs in our squadrons, but I assume you guys had a doctor associated with your, your, uh, unit. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, you don't want to bring anything up until you're certain that it's an issue, you know, right? Um, certainly in our community, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It's just like, hey, I, I, this, it, I, I can continue doing what I need to do, but there's some issues here. So for me, it was like, well, you know, I don't know. Um, I seem to be up doing everything else all right. I don't have, I'm not missing a limb. I'm not missing an eye. So what am I going to complain about? Everybody else is having problems too. I guarantee it. Um, so, you know, I didn't feel a sense of urgency to go and talk about it, um, you know, initially. And it didn't get till my life had just spiraled out of control. And I realized like, oh, I can't go on like this anymore. You know, I'm, uh, I'm a hazard to myself. I'm a hazard to my family. I'm a hazard to my teammates. You know, at that point, it was like, I I need some help. And it wasn't until the train had to come off the tracks until I started to put my hand up and speak. I think the, the personal experiences are important because of, you know, our audience being you know, mainly Marines and guys who fired a lot of uh, uh, rounds downrange. Um, let's go back to the moment of change for you, right? Uh, because a lot of people find themselves at that precipice. Like, okay, is this rock bottom? Is this when I need to make a change? Describe the moment when enough was enough for you and you made the decision to, to heal and get better. Yeah, I mean, there was a, a number of things that kind of led up to, you know, my famous moment, moment of clarity. Uh, I can remember uh, being at NICO uh, the, at uh, Walter Reed, and we're getting all these results back, and I was just having a very hard time. You know, they're you know, like, hey, this guy's got a, you know, neurological deficit and uh, can no longer, you know, be able to, work things out cognitively anymore you know it was just it was shocking to get to get these results back and you know i remember calling just complaining to my mom you know and uh, i'm from texas and you know my mom was born and raised in texas so i'm giving her this sad story and you know she was like hey what did you expect you know what i mean so like what are we going to do about it uh, is what you need to start thinking about because i had gotten to a point where you know hey again i'm have to be medically retired i'm never going to be able to do the things that i thought I was put here to do. Um, 
I, I'm not able to think clearly anymore. I'm not able to uh, be in social situations and act appropriately and respond appropriately to certain kind of um, just regular everyday interaction. And so it continued to just get worse and worse and medication made, made things worse and drinking made things worse. And, you know, uh, things come in threes, right? And so my son was uh, 13 months old and he had this life and death situation and uh, he had this massive uh, growth um, removed from his neck in surgery. And I was sitting there with him at in his ICU after the uh, surgery and right there next to his bedside. And I, I just realized that if I continued on that same path that I was on, that sure enough, man, it would kill me. Um, but, but but worse than that, when I looked down at my boy and just watching him suffer and realizing in that moment that I was of no value to him or my family in the condition that, that I was in. And that was just a, a knockout blow. And for me at that point, like I just made this immutable decision that I didn't care what anybody said anymore. It just meant, meant nothing to me. I promised my boy and myself three things right there at his bedside. Number one, I would return to the man in my pre-injury status. Number two, I was going to find a way to come off all that medication that I was told I was going to have to be on for the rest of my life. And after those two were accomplished, I was going to turn around and spend the rest of my life helping out other people who were in the exact same position that I was in. So that was the, the moment of truth for me that put me in a new timeline. Because at that point, I started asking myself different questions. Instead of focusing on what I didn't want to happen, I got laser focused on what I did want to happen. And I realized what the underlying reason, my personal why for existing was behind that. And for me, I had everything to do with being the man that my family needed me to be. I knew I wasn't going to be a Green Beret anymore. I wasn't going to be an operator anymore. But I was still a husband and I was still a father. And I was going to go back at there on the battlefield of life and give it my all just the way I used to when I was running and gunning. And uh, Sully, that was enough for me to push me over there. And, um, you know, you start asking yourselves, hey, man, if I was going to be the best version of myself, what would I do? What would a morning look like? What would, what, how would I use my time? How would I, what would I put in my body? How would I respond to people? You know what I mean? Where would I go looking when I was told there's no more answers? When you know there was answers out there and asking myself my personal, personally better questions made me look for better answers, which equated to meeting Mark, which means a much higher quality of life now than where I was in 2013, 14 and 15. Sure. Dr. Gordon, what, so, and this is coming from a provider talking to another provider. Understood. How do you, how do you get that spark that Andrew discovered in himself. You know, I, I did. What's really interesting with this is the fact that what Andrew is talking about is the fact that if you go to a regular doctor, I even went to a neurologist a couple of weeks back and I'm talking about doing root cause analysis, getting imagery done, finding out the root cause. And all this doctor wants to do is put me on drugs. I'm like, no, nah, dude, I'm walking out. No. You're not doing that. You're not listening to me. Um, I specifically asked you to get me imagery done, and I got a, uh, a referral to an actual brain surgeon. It's like, well, hey, if you're not going to do your job, we'll just go to a brain surgeon because, well, fuck you. Um, if you're not going to do the root cause analysis, well, then you shouldn't be a neurologist in the first place. And um, go to that guy, you know, going to get the, the actual type of imagery done. And... Uh, the system all it wants to do is churn through a bunch of people as much as possible and obviously because it's a bureaucratic system it just wants more cash right it just exists for more cash and more money laundering and um as we can see you really do need to find independent doctors um and even going down to independent specialists who do this kind of stuff and who don't work for big medical institutions because if you do you're just getting yourself into trouble and um, obviously it costs money and this is where charities need to come in and, and help out um where i'm hoping i can start my own charity to do this sort of thing but um fuck, this is super difficult and you're on your own so you pretty much have to get with doctors 
that I can refer you to and to do your own research. But, um, yeah. Did a lot of, I mean, I've been trained through integrative medicine at Duke University. Uh, what do we call it? There's a name for motivational interviewing, things like that. It is dealing with a heart attack is easier than having someone discover within themselves that spark of change by far. And, and yeah. I'm sure, yeah. How do yeah. you do that? How do you bring that out of people? I don't think it's something you can rule upon yourself. I think it's a culmination of situations in life that brings you to the point that Andrew was at that caused him to have that epiphany, that realization that what he needed to do, as he just expressed, was being a positive influencer and not a negative uh, negative energy, someone more positive to take from the hurt from within. I became a physician because I lost my father to cancer. I was in research, and it's, that was my one of my sparks, if you will. It wasn't anything else. And what led me to specifically this pathway was six head traumas on my own that led me into depression and being on anti and antidepressants and obese. And my escape was reading in the hall, you know, bedroom closed down, reading a book. And it led me to some facts that I went and looked and that opened me up to this area. And 90 days after starting, you know, I had my realization that there was an alternative to just taking some pills and continuing to be in a poor state of mind. But I think each one of us has the ability to find their own spark. And it's not looking for it as much as it finds you. And I think mine found me. And I think Andrew had found him. And it's how to use it and apply it that's the key. I mean, I won't lie and say I don't have cases which are so negative that no matter what I do, they're not going to get better. But I work harder on those. I put more energy into those people who are committed, as you might have been, committed to the mindset because you were told again and again and again, you're PTSD, you're PTSD. And then you assume this illness mindset. And there are articles in the psych world uh, talking about this where you accept this position and therefore nothing else works because you've already given up. You've accepted what their paradigm they believe you should accept. PTSD, just get used to it. Andrew told me many times that when he went back to the VA and told him how difficult life had become in addition to what he had experienced when the medication was put on and the doctor says, carry a, a notepad with you, get used to the new you. He yeah. didn't. He didn't buy into that, but too many guys and gals buy into that. And in buying into that, we now have to bring them up from a pit that was developed or made by that thinking, that philosophy. And not to mention that depression medication, benzodiazepines and other medications crush testosterone down into the complete gutter, not to mention all other types of signals in your body as well. So you have some jackass psychiatrist who's a counterintelligence agent, in my opinion, for a foreign nation, and uh, is then pushing drugs on you um, to make you not an enemy um, <laughs> to the regime um, for being honest and um, is then p pumping a bunch of drugs in you when it's dropping all the other levels which control your mood which is freaking testosterone and uh, growth hormone and other types of signals uh, and then that person has TBI on top of it right so they're already lower than they are and so then you're just pushing them and this is all the the signs and signals that you see in the, in the media whenever there's some sort of shooting it's always oh this person was uh, was had psych psychological issues and oh they were on SSRI. Well, what do SSRIs do? They literally cause <laughs> like these problems. So it's oh signs and the symptoms of this medication, you know, uh, heart attacks, nosebleeds, death, <laughs> <and> suicide, <laughs> suicidal ideations. Like oh really? So you're telling me I'm supposed to take this drug that's supposed to produce that, when instead of that I could just take testosterone, growth hormone, pregnenolone, uh, some glutathione, some vitamin E and vitamin D, um, eat a pseudo type of paleo 
keto-ish diet to lower carbohydrate and lower sugar um and some you know, eat some fish <laughs> and like then you can get better it's like okay well if it's that simple right then why isn't the rest of the medical industry adopting it which should tell you everything that you need to know which is so detrimental to the ability of one spirit to rise above and to have that epiphany to improve and, and for some reason dysfunction becomes an all too powerful force right correct I, I don't I honestly don't know why that is um, but I see it all the time I have conversations with people I have chronic migraines I have chronic back pain I have chronic but hey have you ever thought about you know personally this worked for me I, I never give a dietary advice to people because everybody's different genetics and all this stuff but I went paleo and it made all the difference so I'm like hey mm -hmm. have you ever thought about just cutting out the um, the processed stuff or mm -hmm. or whatever and it's always, it's always, well, I can't because if I don't eat uh, this, I get headaches and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, you, it's frustrating because you are, you're reinforcing these negative habits and then you drink because it helps you relax and what, whatever it is, whatever the dysfunction is. And you just get stuck and that becomes who you are. And it's like, you, you don't have to be that way. You really don't. You can be. You can be the guy, and, and Andrew can can uh, acknowledge this. You can be the guy that raised his hand at the age of 18 and said, "I'm going to enlist, or I'm going to be an officer, or whatever it is." You can be that guy, even though it's 20 years later and you feel like shit. But it's uh, how do you reach that? I mean, that's and and that's the million dollar question. I mean, if you had the answer, <laughs> yeah, be... I think you know, not group counseling, but being in a group of positive people who have experienced what Andrew has experienced having you know small groups where they listen to it and that's why the movie becomes so important because you know when we when uh andrew and jerry did the first uh screening of it there was full house not a single person left there with a dry eye and my question to them was was it sad movie no it was hopeful it gave people the hope that there is an answer out there and that's what the uh, the mission our goal is is to get the information out there. And this tool, the movie, is doing a good job. And sure. as we disseminate it, as the organization disseminates it and more people get to see it, what will happen is more people will have hope. Because right now, there are too many people that are hopeless because they've been integrated into a system that says, oh, just get used to it. This is you. This is the new you. Yeah. And, and you know, to, to Mark's point, and uh, it's, it's about planting the seed, you know, it's, it's the individual's choice, but we can plant the seed. And there's a phrase that, that Mark likes to say a lot that he embodies and, and I attempt to as well is like, hey, we want to be the change. We're going to be the change that we want to see in the world. So let somebody see uh, an elevated per way of living that you embody. And they're going to say, you know, my God, man, what, what are you doing differently? Because I, I know you were struggling down the road here. Uh, how did you get, how did you get to here? And, and so that's why, you know, putting out this information, man, it's liberating. It has the true ability to be liberating because we're talking about an alternative, an alternative where people were told you got one of two options. You got talk therapy over here or you got this bowl of medications over here. That's all we got for you. And we're saying, well, those options still exist, but there's an alternative. And the alternative is based solely and uniquely on you, on well-established science. And so that's the beauty of the situation. I don't think we can change people's minds, but we can deliver them the information in a compelling way that allows them to contemplate that. And then they can come and arrive at their own conclusions. What I'm just ecstatic about is now, at least, there's an opportunity to understand that there are alternatives that exist and they produce significant outcomes and they can be uh, attained by majority of, uh, by everyone. And uh, that, like this information wasn't just easy to find in 2013, 14, and 15 when I was looking for it, even though Mark had been in the field for a number of years. And so now like we just have this body of work and it's just growing every day where people now can go and get a real functional understanding of what's causing this and what to do about it. So that's the exciting thing. You know, I don't know how, how do you fix anybody else? You don't fix it. I don't think you can, but you can just, you know, be the change and plant the seed. 
Dr. Gordon, when does the, uh, and, and I just thought of this question because uh, Andrew said the alternative treatments, when does the alternative become the standard of care that we're all bound to? You know, if I, if I go outside the standard of care for something as simple as a sinus infection, I better write down why I did that. When, when does that shift happen? Um, it's a good question. I've been working on this for 16 years and it's still considered outside the box. But if you look at all the uh, changes that happened in medicine were done by institutes, people who went outside the box because the standards of care were not uh, providing the level of improvement that we need. So, you know, the way I've looked at it historically, it seems like there's a 30 year cycle and that 30 years is usually the lifespan of a new physician. So when the old, uh, old, uh, what do they call it? Guard, the old guard is exchanged for the new guard, then the new guard brings in hopefully a higher level of understanding of what the old guard missed. You know, when you graduate from medical school or from PA school or from NP school or whatever school, DO, you're, you're left with a res residue of your training. And hopefully, if you're aggressive, you go and you get additional training. You know, you read off some of the areas that I went into uh, because I was curious about other areas. And now, you know, we treat people with orthopedic problems with some of our technology and they get better with some of their chronic pain syndrome. But 30 years seems to be the cycle. Um, how to diminish that time means by having more people responding like you, like Andrew, like myself, and the other people that are on program and have them become a voice and a representation of what we're doing. And maybe through a groundswell to have uh, whatever, uh, what we're trying to do, not whatever, but what we're specifically trying to do become accepted faster. Yeah. And so. it's not like you don't have the, the data. I mean, you, you, um, if I remember on your last uh, Joe Rogan uh, uh, episode, you had mentioned that you had done a, a study with the 18 Deltas. I think they're 18 Deltas, right? The um, Special Forces Medics. Uh, oh, uh, Camp Ca Campbell, uh, Fort Campbell, uh, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that they had in 90 days. Um, in 90 days, they were 50 to 70 percent better, uh, not using any hormones, nothing, just our core treatment, which is 100 percent nutraceuticals. And uh, they did so well that they introduced me to their trauma surge, uh, trauma doc from downrange, who ha happens to be a congressman. So he and I are in dialogue. So hopefully we'll get some, you know, some benefits or some input to help us. So we're now reaching out uh, and through Andrew's contacts. We're this is a major problem with the military. Okay, so you have a group of people who are eighteen to fifty who live in a sick population and your expectation is for them so you're going to weed out all these people right and they're going to be in the most top tier um especially 18 delta that's you know, your your special forces medics you're already weeded out um 99.9 percent .9 of the population then you weed out the 0.5 percent of the population that you then just weeded out from to then weed out another point zero 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 seven percent of the population to then will down to those 18 deltas which represent maybe let's say a thousand guys right so it's like this ridiculous anomaly of, of people right who have this intellect who have this physical ability and then who have um well, the ability to clearance and then the ability to uh, work well with these people, which is very difficult and um, uh, a lot of hot tempers and a lot of interesting um, personalities, right? So now you've weeded out all these different people. Now you expect them to then be deploying for years at a time, getting in the shit, getting blown up, who are then supposed to be healthy but then they have TBI, then they're supposed to be treating other people, but then now you complicate it with the fact that the military is an authoritarian type of system in which, so now you come back with TBI, so now you're worthless, but then if you just need your hormones, then you'd be better, but then if you take hormones and you're active duty, then you're non-deployable. So which is it? Are you gonna be healthy? and be on hormones or are you gonna just waste the 11 million dollars whatever that you put into this person it's 
pretty interesting question there. Tentative on a program on the Hill to, to meet and share our information. We were in uh, England uh, with the Ministry of Health and the uh, Ministry of Defense and the uh, military surgeon general um, sharing our experience and what we've done because in England, uh, they were old paradigm and they were having rising numbers and suicides instead of dropping numbers. So we've had a couple of their special forces uh, fly into the office here and uh, they're better. And when I was asked, you know, why are they coming in? I said, maybe they wanted to get better, you know, yeah. because the, as Andrew and I both learned the national national health service in England has a lot to be desired. <laughs> what is the army and the DOD? What are they saying? Um, I had the chance to talk with Fort Detrick, um, help of uh, one of the rear admirals that has been on our program for about eight years, got us into Fort Detrick where I sent them my documents in advance, also sent them a preliminary look at the uh, application for a DOD grant. And we had a conference call with some major people there that ran it and they were curious as to why I didn't have any medication, any drugs in our protocol. <laughs> They're most confused by the fact that there are, confused i might be a little strong but they were didn't know how to understand how we got any benefits if we weren't using antidepressants or antipsychotics or anti-anxiety medications you know so it never went anywhere uh dod um we've got people trying to help us to to get there we wrote a paper andrew and i presented a paper to the white house in 2018 which uh, ended up with the DOD, but it didn't go any place because it was so much of a paradigm shift. Yeah. But we tried to get them on the issue of um, retention and uh, attrition. You know, the amount of money that is spent on special forces for um, for training and so forth, as you know, Andrew will tell you, and all you guys in special forces, the government spends a lot of money, and to have uh, one blast trauma or accumulation of small blasts, uh, sub-concussive blasts, lead to your loss of your career with the military and the loss of the financing. I mean, if we can show them, which is what we're doing, that we can maintain yeah. the activities without loss of cognitive functions, that's a financial benefit. And yeah, we're hitting them on finance. They speak exactly. their language. All the yeah. help may be not important to them, but saving them money, maybe that yeah. is. Yeah, that's it. We tried it, right, Andrew? <laughs> what about the, the uh, what is it? The uh, Congressional Budget Office, the CBO. Oh, CBO, yeah. Yeah, CBO, sixteen thousand dollars a year for each vet. And oh. when we were with forty three with President Bush, we talked to him about we can take that sixteen thousand and it, use it for three years. Wow. That sixteen thousand right. paying a year, we can yeah. take it and use it for three years and get people back up and running. I mean. We're looking at our average time right now, and 78% of our people uh, were 50% or better in a year. And in that group were 16 Vietnam veterans. Our oldest is 84, Ben, in Ohio, or in uh, Oklahoma. And then uh, Jerry here in uh, Las Vegas. I flew out to have lunch with him because at 71 years of age, he was 100% better, according to his wife, Susan, um, you know, the man I married prior to going to Vietnam and having a blast trauma. That's unreal. We've got 16 people. Yeah. Hey, hey, going back to the Congressional Budget Office, how hilarious is that that the government has something called the Congressional Budget Office? That, that, that cracks me up. What are we, the bo trillion in debt at this <laughs> yeah, point? Yeah, yeah it's, um, it's more than that. But, um, yeah, yeah I, I now know that they, they don't care whatsoever about anything attributed to cost. Um, it, it has to benefit their, their bottom line in a different way. But uh, diverting. Um, Mark and I will continue to fight this fight. Well, we made that decision. We're going to fight. I think that will be, if it ever changes, the government will be the last thing to ever institute it. I think there is zero incentive for them to do that. I think they have the exact program in there that they want to. I arrived at that conclusion by being in the trenches with Mark the last five plus years, and the, the data supports it. Otherwise, like, why on earth would you not institute something as simple as making sure an individual can have access to nutraceuticals that could keep their brain in a neuro-permissive environment, which means 
oh, it stops the chronic inflammation from ever being a thing. And we can do that very easily. Our friend Michael Lewis was one of the uh, DOD's top uh, brain injury prevention and treatment docs. Um, Army West Point retired as a colonel. He's talking to the Army Chief of Staff. They're ready to hear all about fish oil. And then out of nowhere, he wrote about this in his book, uh, When Brains Collide, he gets the kibosh. Oh, man, we can't put soldiers on that level of uh, that amount of fish oil. It would be <laughs> toxic. He's like, we're talking about nutrition. Yeah. And you guys are, where are they deficient? You put them on an SSRI. What test is showing that they are deficient in serotonin? Right. <laughs> Zero. Right. So I, I don't I don't foresee any changes happening. So well, this is pretty important, and it basically goes to show that if you know someone that's in medicine, they need to get the training. They need to go to World Link. They need to go to AMFG. They need to go to Dr. Mark Gordon's classes. Um, if you know somebody that's in medicine, you need to refer them to get those classes. And for a uh, um, for a Christmas gift, just buy them the class with World Link. Get them the training. Get them moving in the right direction, especially for your LPNs, your RNs, and your physician assistants and nurse prax. It takes them five seconds. All you got to do, write out a lab course slip, do some blood work, do some uh, you know various exams, and then boom, and then you can refer them off to a you know, neurologist and whatnot. It doesn't take that long. It's easily done. You, a drunk endocrinologist on a Tuesday can look at a testosterone, free testosterone level. Oh, your free testosterone is 10. It's not 50. Okay, we'll get you up to 50. Okay, this isn't fucking rocket surgery. It's pretty str simple and straightforward. Here's the takeaway, guys and gals listening. You got to take your health into your own hands. You got to take responsibility for yourself. It's not the government's job to keep you healthy, happy, and going out and pursuing, you know, life, liberty, and, and all the freedoms that, that the Constitution allotted us. What you have to do is you have to go out there and take it. And if you have to spend your own money, well, then that's what you have to do. And if you have to figure out how to go work with a nonprofit to go get, the, get your help, then you got to figure out how to do that. But there's ways to do those things. You got to take, you got to be the captain of your own ship. The government's not going to come in. The cavalry's not coming in. You got to go out there and you got to figure out what do I got to do? How do I got to start asking myself better questions to make better choices to produce the outcomes that I want to make? So, you know, yes, we have projects going with with different uh, government entities and, and different military units and, and this, that and the other. And we've been producing good results for a long time with those communities. Why has it been instituted? I don't think I think because they don't want to institute it. So therefore, man. Take this information, go out and find the things that are discussed here, see how you can apply it to your own life. That's where you'll start finding the benefit. Listen, listen to that Special Forces NCO come out. That's fantastic. <laughs> Pep talk. Guys, I've kept you on for an hour. Um, I want to end it with this. Um, so someone hears this, right? Someone just hears your little pep talk and they say, I'm going to reach out to Andrew, right? They go over to uh, warriorangelsfoundation.org. Um, there's also waftbi.org that takes you over there. And they send you an email. Hey, uh, where do I start? What, what can I do? Yeah. Uh, the great thing is, is we have a team over there ready to receive you. Um, so go out to our website. There's a wealth of information there. You want to talk to somebody directly. Somebody will be there to tell you uh, how the program works, how you can get involved, uh, and everything in between. So bottom line is WAFTBI is a short uh address waftbi.org for our website you want to get in touch you want more information uh that can that's made available on the website super easy mark's website is tbihelpnow.org and has a wealth of information i mean an incredible amount of information on his website as well so those are the two best ways uh Sully. awesome guys i i really really appreciate it i know time is money um hopefully hopefully we can uh, save a life. I mean, that's the whole point. One person hears this and reaches out to, to either of you and, and ends up feeling better because it's, it's you know, it, we always talk about saving lives, but we also talk about the quality of life. I had a, a friend, he's an orthopedic surgeon, and uh, I, I'm always rolling my eyes when he eats a, I hope he doesn't watch this, he's eating a big plate of pasta and I'm eating, you know, I don't know, a, a elk backstrap and <laughs> vegetables. And, uh, and he's like, He's like, wouldn't you just rather eat this and maybe live a couple years shorter? <laughs> I, said, I said, it's not about that. It's about how I feel, right? And that yes. tastes good, but that will never taste better than 
me going to bed or being a father or being whatever, being present in my daily, daily operations. So I don't know. Well said. So, so thanks gentlemen for coming on. I really, I mean, you have no idea how much I appreciate this. The Reverend Warriors appreciate it. And, um, you know, you're always hearing from me. You'll hear from me again soon. (laughs) No doubt. (laughs) I'm always, I I always tell people it's a sign of, uh, uh, how much I enjoy speaking with you when you start getting texts from me or emails or whatever. But, um, but yeah, no, thank you very much. and, And I really appreciate your time. So after, uh, the whole shebang I wanted to kick off our third installment of TRT for Warriors that this all kind of kicked off by Andrew and Dr. Uh, Dr. Gordon being on uh, Joe Rogan and me digging into the research as well because when you have all these symptoms going on and then you do your own labs and then you end up like with myself, who ended up with a, a family hometown doctor who's went to med school like a thousand years ago in the dark ages, um, who were uh, bleeding you dry for ghosts um, and using it. Oh, would you like some cocaine with that, Melita? And um, uh, just, just the most barbaric uh, type of medicine, um, specifically at first doing clomid monotherapy for like literally a year. And uh, then uh, I had a bunch of macro de- degeneration. My eyes started getting all fucked up and starting to get floaters in the eyes. And then I, then I had a, my whole eye closed up. Um, so I, uh, I stopped taking that medication. I'm like, Hey, I need to get on this injectable garbage. Get me on this. And, uh, it started out like a hundred milligrams, which, uh, you know, I, I kind of agree. You know, you, you might want to start off on something low and slow, um, like a chili or something like that. Um, to not throw in too many hormones at one time, but, um, it obviously didn't work and doing that for like six months and nothing was changing. And I think it was also maybe doing like one, maybe one or two injections a week. I can't remember, but it obviously wasn't working. And then went to like a, um, a cookie cutter clinic, um, which is fantastic for maintenance, but when you're trying to get dialed in and whatnot, and, um, you're trying to to figure out what your actual dose is and how you feel and, and, uh, you know, whatnot. Um, those clinics don't really work very well. So I ended up with a nurse practitioner and, um, I won't out him, but, um, there are very, I've mentioned various clinics and he's one of them in there, but, um, you can go to various different clinics or whatnot who specialize in TRT and um, what they're going to do is going to run your blood. You're going to look at what your lab values are um, and focus on what's deficient, what needs to be um, brought above um, what maybe could help. So maybe there's a peptide and maybe there's a different type of medication that can help you that may not be a hormone, but it might you know help you significantly or whatnot. Um, and, just reaching out and starting in that first place where you get your testosterone um, dialed in, then you work on your growth hormone, then you work on thyroid, and then you work on, um, say, pregnenolone or another another hormone or whatnot, and uh, you get that dialed in. Um, when you start coming off different medications, you start feeling better. Um, bottom line is reach out. Get the care that you need. Don't suffer. If you're going through the VA, don't. Go through a a regular civilian clinic. Um, Don't even put up with the VA. There's no point to it. There's one doctor in the entire VA who does testosterone replacement therapy the correct way. So don't even, it's not worth your time. Um, Get dialed in. Figure out what you need to be, and then you might be able to transfer your 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 medications long term. But that's kind of a, a risk when it comes to the VA um, and big healthcare systems because they don't understand how to dose this shit. So, um, but find the the right type of of practitioner, um, and uh, don't suffer. Get treatment. Reach out. Talk to me. 
um, and join our group TRT for Warriors on uh, on Facebook. And um, you guys have an awesome weekend.